Today's stuff we're going to be learning today is Sota Daf Dalid. I will remind everybody this is the last day of Zoom for the next week and a half. Starting tomorrow, there won't be Zoom anymore. Starting today already, all the Shireen for this week through Shabbat will be posted up on the site. So you can get ahead of your learning if you would like. Um, if not, just you'll figure it out every day as a link back to the catch up on the Daf page. And then you can basically find whichever Daf you want, the, the, the day of each Daf is on there so everyone can, you know, is able to see which stuff you need. Just try to keep track for yourself. I know it'll be a little confusing, but it's worth it, I thought, so the people, especially those with a three-day holiday, will have time to learn in advance if you want. Okay, this week's learning is sponsored by Naomi Klatman in honor of her birthday that was on the 8th of Nissan. With thanks to the Hadron team and Rabbanit Farber who prepare and teach the daf. Wishing all who listen to Hadron's daily daf Yomi Shir a year of abundant and revealed brachot in all areas of life, physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. Today's daf is sponsored by Jill and Jeff Shames in loving memory of Sina Baker, Shifra Bad Zela Ubracha on her eighth year at site. The days fly by, the years pass, and you remain the wind beneath my wings. Today's stop is sponsored by Jordana Hyman in honor of their wonderful son, Svi Amichai Hyman Borowski, on his gius today. We are so proud of you, our first sabras. We observe your sense of shlichud and commitment to serve our country and our people. May Hashem protect and bless you always with your fellow soldiers, mom and dad. Today's stop is sponsored by Susan Kurtzman, Liloy Nishmat, or Shandy Kurtzman, Liloy Nishmat, or of Yosef Ben Harab, Shmuel Yitzchak Leib, her father, Alava Shalom, on his fifth year at site. A brilliant yet humble man, a consummate teacher, and a wonderful father who showed me the importance of always learning and studying. Okay, one last um, announcement. First of all, the Zoom will resume on Friday after Pesach. And um, one last announcement. If anyone has dedications starting from tomorrow through to the end of next week, so we will be able to put them in, but only in the written, um, the written that goes on the website and, um, and will be sent out by WhatsApp, but not in the, in the audio. And, um, and if you do want it, just make sure to send it in advance because of the holiday. We're not working. We're working on a much tighter, uh, l- a much lesser schedule. Okay. Um, so we're going to get started with our daf. We actually ended in the middle of a bright time. And we're going to have a very strange beginning of the daf. And I say beginning, I mean actually all the way until the second, I would say the first, like the fifth line of Amu Bet. Okay. So we're going to talk about the first topic is one major topic, which is in the continuation of this bright that we started yesterday, the Kamashi or Stira. We have this woman who's a Sota. Um, by the way, there's a new introduction to Sota that went up in Hebrew of Daf Mishalahen. You might remember Rabbi Niyot Shiran Kamital, who um, were now separated by an ocean and therefore by, by a, a big ocean, big um, whatever huge separation between them right now is Kamital is in America and she was here in Israel. But they got together and they recorded a, um, Shira was visiting and they recorded a Dach Mishalah Hen this week. It's up on Facebook and up on our site. So if you want to listen in Hebrew, another introduction to Sota. If you haven't seen the other ones, Gita's written introduction and Ayel Lipson's um, Shior. So, Bekana Shior Stila. So now we have this issue. We have this woman who became impure, right? She was alone with a man in a room. We don't know yet what happened in that room. But we said that the amount of time that the witnesses have to say, or even the husband himself, depending on which opinion you go by, say she was in this room alone for X amount of time. How much time? Now I'm going to remind you before we start this sugya, the beginning of Masechet Brachot. You might remember the first daf of Masechet Brachot. You might not remember. But the first daf of Masechet Brachot begins with, right, when, from when do you start saying Shema at night? And then there's a whole discussion, and there's many, many different opinions. There's at least... There's five in a Brita, there's two in the Mishnah, maybe some of them overlap, but there's a lot of different opinions. And each one describes it in words. They don't describe it exactly at sunset, exactly as the stars, you know, appear, uh, you know, five minutes after, ten minutes, right? They didn't speak the way we speak nowadays. If we'd say what time, you would give a very exact time. But they didn't discuss it that way. They described it in words from the time the poor person goes to eat his bread, from the time that people eat on Erev Shabbat, from the time, and they describe it in words. This is the exact same thing we're going to have here. So first the Gemara says, the first, I'm sorry, the Brayta says, the first opinion is, Kedei Tum'ah, Kedei Bi'ah, Kedei Ha'ra'ah, Kedei Ha'kafatek. This is a description. This is actually the one that's the most elaborate description. And we're going to have to understand why he went into so many words. Kedei Tum'ah means the amount of time. And this is, I didn't read the next words, which is Divrei Rabbi Yishmael. This is Rabbi Yishmael's opinion. The amount of time it takes to become tame, which here means not impure. Impurity means 
to have relations. And then they say, Kedei Bia, which is also to have relations. So there's a bit of redundancy here. And then it says, Kedei Hara'a. Hara'a is not having relate. It's not the completion of relations. It's just the beginning. Okay, the man entering into the woman. So just the amount of time for that. And then they describe it, Rabbi Yishmael describes it in some other word, Kedei Hakafateka. It's the amount of time it would take to walk around a date tree. Okay, a palm tree. That's Devere Rabbi Yishmael. Rabbi Eliezer Mel, Kedei Mezigat Kos. Rabbi Eliezer says it's the amount of time it takes to prepare a cup of wine. Remember, preparation in those days, it was to concentrate the wine and you would add water to it. So the amount of time you would take to fill up a cup the size of a ribi eat, that's a very relevant size now because it's right a quarter log, so the size also for the cups we're supposed to drink on Pesach. Rabbi Yoshua Omel, Kedelish Toto, the amount of time it takes to drink the cup. Ben Azai Omel, Kedelit Slope Beitza, the amount of time it takes to roast an egg. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Kedei Legam'a, the amount it takes to eat an egg. Okay, very strange. We're describing it in all sorts of random ways here. Rabbi Yudah Ben Betera Omer, Kedei Legam'a, Shalosh Betzim Zohar, so the amount of time it takes to swallow three eggs, one after the other. Rabbi Liazar Ben Yirmi Omer, Kedei Lekshor Gardeni Ma. Now, we, okay, we had, we had a few different categories. One is the amount of time it takes to go around this tree. Then we had wine-related, either to prepare the wine or to drink the wine. Then we had to prepare the egg or to drink the egg, uh, eat the egg, or maybe to eat three eggs. Then we have Kedelik Shor Gardeni Ma. If while you're weaving, the, the thread breaks in order to tie it back together. Chanin ben Pinchas Omer, Kedesh Toshit Yada Litoch Pia Litol Kesam. These next two are going to have to do with an action of the woman, which almost sounds a little bit of, you know, the amount of time it takes for the woman to do something. But here it's not going to be anything sexual related, although maybe there's some sort of connection there. But she, the amount of time it would take to put her hand in her mouth and take out a, a toothpick that she has in her mouth. The amount of time it would take a woman to go into a basket, put her hands in the basket and take out a loaf of bread. Afapi, just for this one, Afapi she'em ra'ya ladabar, even though we don't have a proof for this, zecher ladabar, there is, this is a, a phrase they like to use a lot, we don't have a passage to prove this, but there is a verse in the Torah that alludes to this. What is it? Ki ba'ad isha zona ad ki kar lechem. This connects between an isha zona, which is our sota, and it connects with this loaf of bread. So we have this connection of loaf of bread, ah, the woman taking out the loaf of bread, maybe that's the amount of time it takes to have sexual relations. Okay, so now we're going to start, that's our brighta. Now we're going to start questioning the brighta. So we have, I didn't even count how many opinions, but here we can put up the sheet, and then you can see how many different opinions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think I just counted nine. Yeah, nine different opinions. That's a lot. Okay, that's even more than brachot. So now they first ask, why do you have all this? And they don't mean all these opinions. We'll get to that at the very, very end. Only after that are they going to answer that question. But why did Rabbi Yishmael say, why did he describe it in four ways? He needed to. Why? Okay, now on our sheet, I'm going down. It's actually under the chart because this wasn't really relevant for the chart. So now you're going to see from the chart, if you're on the sheet, you can see there's two brighto. In the second, we're going to, in another minute, we're going to quote another brighta that's going to contradict this first brighta in many, many ways. And therefore, I charted them out. It makes it much simpler to see. Okay, so even if your Hebrew is not good, you'll be able to follow at least the chart and the contradictions. So now we have the following. The Gemara says, why did Rabbi Yishmael need to say all four of these things? Well, Sricha, he needed to. Why? Di'itana kadei tum'a. Have, I mean, if you just said Kedei Tuma, the amount of time it takes for relations, what might you have thought? Kedei Tuma Tava Artsuta. Okay, there's two stages to having relations. The first is the, either whether you call it foreplay or you call it, you know, just till he convinces her to have relations with her. There's the beginning part where Ritsui is to appease her, to get her into it. Then you would think maybe you need to include that time, factor that into the, situ into the picture. Kamash Malan Kedei Bia. Well, that's why it says first Kedei Tumah, and then it says, well, not, you know, Kedei Tumah would have been much broader. You then need Kedei Bi'ah to say, well, right, because Kedei Bi'ah is redundant. So the fact that you have two means to tell you, well, we're narrowing it, okay? It's not Tumah, which includes Tumata and Artsota, relations and the foreplay, but Kamashal Kedei Bi'ah is, well, not that, but the actual time it takes to have relations. Then they say, V'yesh Me'inan. Uh, sorry, the itana kedei bia, hava amina kedei gemar bia. You might have thought then, if you said tuma 
and then Bia comes to narrow it, not including the foreplay. Then we need to narrow it even more to say, well, not Gemar Bia, but Kedeh Only the beginning of Bia is enough. V'i'a Shmina Kedeh Hava Mina Kedeh Ha'ra'a Now, if you just had Kedeh Ha'ra'a, or even Kedeh Ha'ra'a and Tum'a, you would have thought, Tum'a is telling you Tum'a V'artsota. You would have thought it included both, right? Also the foreplay. Then you have Kedeh Ha'ra'a, which is to limit, in what way though? To say, not complete Tum'a, not the complete action, but even just the beginning action. So therefore, Kamash V'lan Kedeh Tum'a, and Kedeh Bia, and Kedeh Ha'ra'a, to tell you each one limits it. Kedeh Bia limits it. Get rid of the Ritzoi, get rid of the foreplay. Kedeh Ha'ra'a says, get rid of Gemar Bia, you only need the beginning. And that's why you needed all three. Vekama Kedeh Ha'ra'a, and then you needed to say, well, how do you assess how long this could be, this is? Ah, Kedeh Ha'kafatekel. So then you go back to the Ha'kafatekel, which is the description of if the amount of time it takes a person to walk around to encircle a palm tree, that's your answer as to how much all this time takes. Now the Gemara brings a contradiction from a bright, Uriminhi. And here's the second bright we're going to get to. Vinistira, which is the quote from the Pasuk. And she goes into a room alone with this man. Now, how long this takes, we don't know. When it says in the Pasuk, Vinistira, Vihinitma'a, okay, which connects, we saw this already, the connection between the Stira and the Tumma, what do we learn from that Pasuk? There were two different answers, depending on whether you want to say you only need one witness for the stira. But if you don't say that, which is what we know, we do, we don't say that. It's to tell you the nistira How long do you need to be alone in the room with a man? We saw this on the on the doc before. That it's the amount of time it takes to have relations. It was at the bottom of bet on the bet. And how long is that? Right? Kedei Tum'ah, Kedei Bi'ah, Kedei Ara'ah. This sounds just like Rabbi Yishmael. Kedei Chazarat Dekel. What's the problem here? It says Divrei Rabbi Yezeh. But wait, didn't we just say that was Rabbi Yishmael? Okay, and now this whole Brite, you can already see. These words for Rabbi Yishmael go to Rabbi Yezeh. Rabbi Yezeh's words, Kedei Mezigat Kos, are attributed to Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Yeshua's words, Kedei Lishtoto, are attributed to Ben Azai. Okay, so, and, and so on and so on. Ben Azai says, Litzlo Beitza. On our Brite, it's going to say, Kedei Litzlo Beitza is Rabbi Akiva. Kedei Legoma is Rabbi Akiva in the first Brite. It's Rabbi Yehuda Ben Beter in the next Brite. First of all, it looks like they just made a mistake and skipped the first person, and then kind of it would have all lined up properly. Okay, but that's not the type of answer the Brite, is, the Gemara is going to bring. The Gemara is going to try to explain why each of these say something different in each Brite and how they work together. Okay, that's going to be the gist of what we're going to do right now. So again, let me just go through all the opinions. So that was Rabbi Yezer, Rabbi Yeshua Amir Kedem Zigat Kos, the amount of time it takes to prepare this cup of wine, which again, as I said, was Rabbi Yezer in the previous Brita. Ben Az, I says Kedem Lishtoto, which was Rabbi Yeshua in the previous Brita. Rabbi Akiva says Kedem Lishtot Beitza, to roast an egg, which was Ben Az in the previous Mishnah. Rabbi Yehuda Ben Betera says Kedem Legoma, to eat the egg, and that was Rabbi Akiva in the previous Brita. And then that's it. Okay, we don't have the last opinions of the of the weaving and the woman putting her hand in her mouth to take out the toothpick or putting her hand in the basket. Okay, so we don't have any of those in this bright. So now the Gemara is going to start with all their questions. First of all, Kasanka Data, I know, now I didn't pay so much attention to this before, I didn't point this out, but it's very important to notice. Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Lezer say the same thing other than one word. Rabbi Shmuel say Kedei HaKafat Ekel, which is to walk around the dekel, and Rabbi Leizer said, "Kedei Chazarat Dekel," for the dekel to go back to its place. So now, Kasal Kedata, Hainu Hakafat Dekel, Hainu Chazarat Dekel. They thought that these two things mean the same thing. In which case, we have a problem because Hatam Amar Rabbi Yishma Kedei Hakafat Dekel Upalig Rabbi Leizer Ale. In the first brayta, this was said in the name of Rabbi Yishma, and Rabbi Leizer disagreed with him. Right? The assumption is, if he disagreed, he must say, "I don't agree." Right? If he has his own opinion, he must not agree with the previous. And Hacham or Rabbi Kedei Chazarat But here Rabbi Lezer says the exact same thing that Rabbi Yishmael said. So Amar, Abai, no, 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 they're not the same thing at all. Hakafa beregel, Chazara beruach. Hakafa is to go around the tree, and Chazara is for the tree to be waving in the wind and then come back. So by Ravashi, and remember this, because Ravashi is going to come back all the last set of answers, he's going to ask the same type of question on, same type, not the exact same question. But he's going to ask a question that's going to be left without an answer. 
Is it the wing goes and comes back, right? And it sways in the wind. Is that what we mean? Or is it when the tree sways and then comes back to its place? Which presumably those are different amount of times. So the answer is teku. Okay, we don't know. We don't know the answer to Rav Ash's question. Now we have another problem with Rabbi Eliezer, which is in the first bright he said, and this is why it's important to see the chart, he said okay, while you're preparing the cup of wine, had the amount of time. But in our bright, the new bright he says with this blowing in the wind. So how do we resolve that contradiction? To which they say, and you might remember this from the first page of Brachot as well, if you don't remember, don't worry. I happen to have taught that off many times, so I know it very well. These are the same amount of time. So in other words, when you describe time in words, if you say five minutes and you say two minutes, you can't claim those are the same. But if you describe something in words, then you can describe it in words in one way, you can describe it in words a different way, and they both might mean two minutes. So basically, you can say the Kedem Zigakos and Kedem Chazaratekel are the same thing, and he's not contradicting himself at all. Now, you might think we could answer this for all the questions, but you're going to see in a minute why you can only answer this for every other one. Okay? And you'll see this in one second. Now, Rabbi Yoshua said, in order to drink the cup of wine. And, by, and in the new bright, he said, in order to prepare the cup of wine. Now, so it must be that Rabbi Yoshua in each place got cut off. And what he really meant, he said in one place to drink the cup, in another place to prepare the cup. What he really means is to prepare the cup of wine and to drink it. Okay? Now, why couldn't you have said, Why didn't we just answer the same thing as before? Oh, it's just describing in different words, different amounts of time. Well, there's a very obvious reason. Because in Ken, if he really meant Kedelish Toto, which is the same as Kedem Zigat Kos, we have a problem with Brighta number one. Because in Brighta number one, Rabbi Eliezer said Kedem Zigat Kos, which we said is the same as Kedem Chazarat Dekel. So let's say that's two minutes. You can't have Rabbi Yeshua saying Kedem Zigat Kos, otherwise he's not disagreeing with Rabbi Eliezer. And then again, there's an assumption. This was the exact same thing in Brachot, which is if they're listed in the Brighta, as a list of people all with different opinions, they have to all have different opinions. It wouldn't make sense that they have the same opinion. So if you say that Kedelish Toto is the same as Kedem Zigakos, then Hainu Rabbi Eliezer. Then Rabbi Yeshua is going to be saying the same thing as Rabbi Eliezer and it can't possibly be. And that's what we have to do joining them. Okay, you're going to see this. Every other one is going to have the other a- answer. So you'll, you'll see in a minute why this is. Ha Tamar Ben Azai Kedelish Lop So now let's move to Ben Azai. Again, as I showed you before, Everyone in the second Brighta said what the previous one said in the previous Brighta, right? So, again, Ben Azai said to roast an egg in the first Brighta. In the second Brighta, he said to drink the cup of wine. Now, we have no problem saying that they're the same. Why? Because Rabbi Yeshua, when he said to drink a cup of wine, he only said it meant to prepare the wine and to drink it. So there's no problem. So Ben Azai, we're going to answer the same way we answered Rabbi Yezir, which is, he said two different things. We're going to say to roast an egg and to drink a cup of wine or one and the same. In each place, he just described it in different words. Now, next, and now we're going to have the same problem we have with the Rabbi Yoshua contradiction. You'll see in a minute. Rabbi Yoshua, I'm sorry, Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said to swallow in the first one, to swallow the egg. But here he said, the second Brita, to roast an egg. Now, remember, Ben Azai a minute ago said to roast an egg is the shiur. It's either to roast an egg or to drink a cup of wine, which is the exact same amount of time. So now we can't say that Rabbi Akiva says Kedelogoma is the same as Kedelitzlopetza because then what are you going to have the problem, right? That Kedelitzlopetza is the same as Ben Azai and he's disagreeing with Ben Azai. So we're going to have to answer it the same way we answer Rabbi Yeshua, the person two before him, which was, Kedelish Toto and Kedem Zigakos is both pour the cup and drink it. Same thing with Rabbi Akiva. Roast the egg and swallow it. Ema Kedelitz Lop Beitza Ulegoma. Okay, so to roast the egg and to eat the egg. That's what it must be. To which again they ask, Why don't we just say, Kedelogoma 
is the same as Kedele Tzlopetza, and that's what he meant, and we already know, because in Ken, Hainu Ben Azai. Then he'd be saying the exact same thing as Ben Azai. So as you see here, every other one is answered in the same way. Again, Rabbi Leezer, it's, it's the same. Rabbi Yeshua, it's this plus that. Ben Azai, it's they're the same. And Rabbi Kiva is this plus that. And now we get stuck with Rabbi Yehuda Ben Batera. Hatamam Rabbi Yehuda Ben Batera kadeli gemar shalosh betzim zoah harzo. In the first bright he said it's it's eating three eggs one after the other. And hacha amal kadeli gamah. By us he said it's swallowing one egg. So first of all you can't say it's swallowing one plus three, and you can't say swallowing one egg is the same as swallowing three eggs. It clearly isn't. So none of those answers we can't just pull them out of a hat and say oh put this answer there. So how are we going to respond to this? What we're going to say is, really, he holds kedei legoma, okay, to swallow an egg, which nobody said yet, because Rabbi Akiva said it, but when he said to swallow, he meant to swallow, to roast the egg and to swallow. So he must hold kedei legoma, but what's, so why did he say to swallow three eggs, one after the other? Well, he said it right after Rabbi Akiva said to swallow, which we understood is to, sw- to roast the egg and to swallow it. So comes Rabbi Akiva and he said, uh, Rabbi Yehuda ben Batera, and he says, after Rabbi Akiva Kamar. He must have been responding to Rabbi Akiva and saying, Amar Misharim Okay, again, this is assuming our reading, which is when Rabbi Akiva said to swallow it, what he meant is to roast and to swallow it, which by the way could be understood. You know, Ben Azai said to roast it, and Rabbi Akiva says to swallow, meaning in addition to roasting, it should be, right, it's the roasting and swallowing. To which Rabbi Yudha ben Batera says, why would you put it in those terms, as to roast and to swallow? Those are two different actions. Why don't you just use a swallowing action and just say, right? The assumption is if you roast an egg and you swallow it, it would probably be the same amount of time as swallowing three eggs. So why don't you just say the amount of time it takes to swallow three eggs, instead of saying to roast the egg and to swallow it? Because again, that would be the same amount. So when he says this line, to swallow three eggs, one after the other, he doesn't mean that's my opinion. He's saying, Rabbi Akiva, you could have said it in a much better way. Okay, and that's the end. Now we're going to go to, as I promised, Rabbi Ashi is going to ask, well, I promised, but I mentioned that Rabbi Ashi, who asked the question earlier, is going to ask questions on these last three opinions. To tie the, the, the tears and when you're weaving. So, by Rav Ashi, or Are they far from each other or are they close to each other? If they're far from each other, it's going to obviously take longer. If they're closer to each other, it'll take less time. Take, we don't know. So now, right, we're on the next opinion, which is she puts her hand in her mouth to take out a toothpick. By Rav Ashi, Dimahadik or Dalamahadik. Is it stuck in your teeth or is it not stuck in your teeth? Right? You ever get dental floss stuck in your teeth? It takes a long time to get it out. Take Right? But if it's not stuck in your teeth, it's two seconds. Now we're going to have the longest slew of questions here. By Rav Ashi, Dimahadik or Dalamahadik. Is the, is the, bread stuck in, is it, you know, stuck to the, did it, was it, you know, a little sticky bread and it got stuck to the, to the basket or not? Was it new or old? Okay. The assumption is, was the, we're talking about the basket, a new basket that was just woven has like prickly things coming out. It's not smooth enough yet. So if it's not so smooth, it's going to be harder to take the bread out because the bread might get stuck or old, where if the basket's old, it's already very smooth and much easier to take out. Was it hot bread or not hot? If it's hot, we all know it's hard to handle. So it takes a longer time to take it out. It's also a little bit more fragile. Moving now to Amud Bed. Is it wheat bread or barley bread? Remember, we talked about the barley, barley bread. We're going to actually get to barley bread, how bad barley bread is. We're going to talk about it because the mincha, the sota, is offered from barley, and it's a really not things people really ate more, it was like animal food. But the point is that the barley, according to Rashi, the barley is a much um, coarser bread, and therefore, again, it's harder to handle. Um, so, and the, and the wheat bread is very smooth. Birakiko bakusha, is it soft or hard? Again, if it's soft, it's going to take longer to handle because you have to be more careful with it. Well, after all these questions, we don't have an answer. We're left with take.
Okay, so that was our long brighter with all these different opinions about how long it takes for a couple to have the beginning of relations. That's basically the, the amount of time. As you see, it's not very long, right? Because again, it doesn't include any, you know, any of him trying to convince her to have relations or any of that prep time. It's a very, very short amount of time. It makes it, right, we're going to see many things that make it more difficult to become a so. This actually makes it very easy because she doesn't have to be in the room very long for this to, to happen. So now we get to the line that we've kind of been maybe waiting for, maybe not waiting for, but it's kind of funny the Gemara says this. But I'm Rabbi Yitzhak Bar Yosef, I'm Rabbi Yochanan, without asking the question, he's basically trying to say, why are there so many different opinions here? To which he says, right, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, they quote, Kol echav echav Everybody here basically went by their own experience, okay, which Makes a lot of sense because no two actions are the same by people, right? Just like we know in lots of ways, right? People take different amount of times to eat, right? People take different amounts of time to have relations. So everyone, first of all, it's not something they discussed on the street, although they apparently did discuss this in the Gemara, but you know, they didn't discuss what goes on in their bedroom. So here we have it, okay? Each person said, oh, from my own personal experience, this is how long it takes me. So that's what they wrote and that's what they said. To which the Gemara is a very interesting question. So, Ha'ika Ben Azai, Dilo Nasib, but wait, Ben Azai wasn't married, so what personal experience did he have? So the Gemara is going to have three explanations. Ibai Ema, Nasib Parishava. Okay, so we know that he wasn't married, but maybe he was married at some point and got divorced, so maybe he did have some experience with this. Ibai Ema, option number two, Mirabi Shmi'alei, maybe he learned it from his rabbi. Also remember the beginning of Bracha when the guy sneaks under the bed of his rabbi and he says, Torai velomda, I need tzarich, right? I need to learn it. So, you know, especially if he was learning Sota, he needed to know how much time his rabbi taught him and that's why. Vibayit ema, sod Hashem lirei'av. Or maybe God reveals his secrets to those who fear him. And maybe from there, Ben Azai got, had, first of all, we know he was one of the four that Nechnesu Pardes. He did have secrets of God, you know, he was kind of, a lot of Torah was revealed to him. And maybe that's why. So the secret of God is with him and God revealed it to him, even though he didn't have any personal experience. Okay. Very interesting sugya that they have this whole discussion. Um, again, it, it makes it right that, that this is something that we can't really measure. It's different for everybody, right? Of course, we need halacha and we need to know, you know, and that's why each one kind of brings their own personal experience to the table. Right? It's, it's very interesting because in general, I think that we can say a lot of people come to their decisions about halacha often from their own personal experience, but the Gemara doesn't usually express it so clearly like it does in this case. Anyway, interesting sugya. We're going to move on. Darash Rav Avira. Okay, before I, I start, we're going to now see how we're going to go off on tangents and how we get there. So in the first Brita, the very last opinion was this opinion that said, it's the amount of time the woman takes to take out a piece, a loaf of bread from a basket. And then it said, we have an allusion to this in a verse, which is, Kiba'adi shazona ad kikar lechem. Okay, it's a Pasuk in Mishle, which basically says, right, that an uh, shazona, uh, right, so... We're going to talk about what the different ways of understanding this pasuk, right? It sounds like, you know, you'll pay for any shazona ad kikar lechem or something like, a, you know, up to a loaf of bread, which we'll see what they mean by that. And then the end of that pasuk, we're going to get to at the end of today's stuff, which is ish et ish nefesh tatsut, okay? Which we're going to see who's exactly capturing, but an ish et ish, a, 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 a beautiful soul or a valuable soul can be, can be um, conquered or trapped by an ish et ish basically warning about getting into relations with a married woman. So now the Gemara says, so the first thing they translate was, this is how long it takes to have relations with her, the amount of time it takes to pick a loaf of bread out of a basket, which certainly doesn't seem the simple reading of that pasuk. So Darish Rav Avira, sometimes he, learned, he quoted this in the name of Rabbi Ami, that he learned it from sometimes in the name of Rabbi Asi. He says the following drasha on that pasuk, a different drasha. Totally different topic. Anyone who eats bread without washing their hands first. Okay, why do you wash your hands before eating bread? Because we say, your hands touch all sorts of things. They're shniot. If you put water, right, so we want to wash our hands because if you were coin and you touch truma, then your hands could pass on truma to a shlishi. And okay, normally you don't pass on to food and drink if you're a shani, but yes for truma and sacrificial meat. 
So because of the Kohanim, they would have to wash their hands of it. And also, if you remember, we learned that all these people kept standards of Tum'ah as if they were Kohanim, like Tahara, really, of purity, as if they were Kohanim. So people will wash their hands, and then we, we remained with this custom. So now we're going to have all these statements trying to support, you know, why it's so important. You can imagine why they're saying it's super important, because maybe people weren't being so careful about it. If you eat bread without netilat yadayim, it's as if you have relations with a married woman, which you get the death penalty for, right? So that's pretty serious, it's trying to say. How do we know this? Because here we compare when uh, a prostitute with a loaf of bread. So we say, ah, oh, look, this is what, right? This is what will happen to you if you eat your bread without washing. And the Maral explains it. What's the significance of eating bread without washing, right? It's like you're basically coming in touch something sanctified without kind of, you know, without really recognizing God is behind this or without having any, right? You're just eating it as if you, right? As if it all belongs to you, which is the same as the Nisha Zona. It all belongs to you and it doesn't really all belong to you, right? It's from God. You need to sanctify it. It's this idea of us benefiting from this world without understanding that there's something more going on here, like thinking everything belongs to you, this entitlement. Same thing with the Nisha Zona. She belongs to some other man. What are you doing with her? So it's, there is a similar idea I'm a rabbi. Rabbi says, how could you darshan the pasuk in that way? Hi, ba'ad isha zona ad kikar lechem. It doesn't make sense. The pasuk says, on behalf, for a, a prostitute until a loaf of bread. If you wanted to be the way you wanted to say it, it should have said, ba'ad kikar lechem ad isha zona mebaili. You want to say eating a loaf of bread is like a, a, a harlot, you know, it's like a woman who's married. You should have said that in that order. The pasuk should have said in your way. Eating bread without washing, right? The bread should have come first. The woman should have come second. So, El Amaravi has a different interpretation. If you have relations with a prostitute or a married woman, in the end, you're going to be on the streets begging for bread. You're going to become impoverished. That's your punishment. Amaravi Zreik, Amaravi Lazar, back to the topic now of bread. Another statement basically saying anyone who's not careful about washing will be uprooted from this world. What that means, right? Good question. But either you'll be punished by God, you'll be uprooted in this world, in the next world. We don't know. But again, it's just a way of encouraging people to do this mitzvah, right? Again, nowadays it's all about positive reinforcement. In those days, it was more, you know, the threat tactic. Amor of Chiyabarashi Amarav. One more, a few more things about Nitila Yadaim, and then we'll get back to our topic of men sleeping with married women. When you wash, before you eat bread, you have to pick up your hands. When you do the mayim, the water washing after the meal, which was really to get rid of the melach stomit, this salt, there was the sodomite salt that they would have in their hands. If they touched their eyes, they could blind themselves. Then you go down. Now, first of all, it makes sense you put your hands down because you want to get rid of all the zuma. You want it off your body. Mayim Rishonim, why we pick up our hands in a second, we're going to see. Tanya Namihachi, there's a bright to support the first part. Hanotel Yadav Sirich Sheyagbiya Yadav Lamala. Shema Yetzua Mayim Chutz Laperek. Your hand, if you wash, normally what might happen, the water might drip up by, beyond your wrist. And then what will happen? You'll wash the first time. Now, the wa water that goes in your hands the first time actually becomes impure by your hands. So, because mashkim actually get impure from your hands. So, the water the first time you wash is impure water. That's why you wash two times. Okay, now we're going to learn something important that you might not have known. Why do we wash twice? Because you want to get rid of the impure, right? You take pure water, put it on your hands, your hands and purify it. Then you want to get rid of that water, so you do it twice. So now they say, if even if you wash twice, what's going to happen? You wash up until your wrist, basically. So if the water dripped down a little and then drips back, even after you wash your hands the second time, you might end up with impure water that's going to get back on your hands. So you want to avoid this. And therefore, what do you do? You basically pick up your hands so that all the water drips all the way down and it will not come back on your hands. Okay? And that's why you do it in that way. Last statement about this. If you eat bread, again, another scare tactic. If you eat bread without what, drying your hands, because the drying gets off again. We're worried about getting off the imp if there is something impure. You need to dry your hands. It's as if you're eating lechem tame. It's as if you're eating impure bread. Again, they're going to darshan this pasuk from Yechezkel. 
ככה יאכלו בני ישראל על לחמם טמא. There's a way to eat bread that's eating bread like it's טמא, and then it, it goes on to say it's like the way the Gentiles eat, and it's saying this isn't the way we're supposed to do it, and they say, what does this mean if you eat your bread without drying your hands before? Okay, back to our topic. So now we had this pasuk, as I mentioned before, ki ba'adi shazona ad ki karlatim, which we darshan in a bunch of ways. The end of that pasuk is, eshet ish nefesh yikarat tatsud. Okay, a married woman, uh, an, uh, a spirit, Precious soul will be trapped. Amar Rabbi Chir Bar Abba, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Kol adam sheyesh bo gasut haruach, levasof nechshal be'eshet ish. So now we say, instead of saying that the target is the, the married woman and she's the one who's seducing the man, they say, no, no, no. It's an arrogant man who will end up, this is what we talked about before, will end up with a married woman. Because what are arrogant people? They think we're entitled to everything, so they don't care that she belongs to somebody else. How do we know it? From our pasuk. Now they understand this not in the simple reading. Nefesh yikara, instead of precious, it means arrogant, because someone there's a fine line between being, you know, high and in a good place and high and in a bad place. So a nefesh yikara tatsud, it's saying he will conquer her, right? A nefesh yikara, a very arrogant person, will entrap an eshatish. And that the blame is on him. This is right again. You know, you, you get to Sota and you think if you read the Torah, like it's all the blame is on the women. But the rabbis already a few times have started putting the blame on the men as well, right? Either on the husband, that it's his fault, as we saw in the first half. And now it's saying also it's the fault of the man who seduces her. So now I'm a rabbi. Rabbi says, just like he said before, wait, the order of the pasuk or the wording of the pasuk doesn't match your drasha. Hi, nefesh yikara, nefesh gvo hamibayle. Number one, it shouldn't say yikara. Yikara is a very positive term. It should say gvoha. Arrogant, high and mighty. Ve'od, hitatsu mebaile. It seems like the Pasuk is saying she's the one who conquers him. So if you wanted to say nefesh yikara tatsud, you would say nefesh yikara hitatsud. So it's very clear that you're referring to the nefesh yikara, that's the one who's doing the conquering and not the woman. So El Amar, Rabbi, he understands it from the Pasuk differently. What this Pasuk means, kol habal eshet ish, afilu lamad Torah, is a very important line. Okay, especially nowadays when we have Torah scholars who end up doing really, you know, inappropriate things with women, with, with men, you know, with children. Okay, if you have relations with a married woman, even if you learn Torah, the is a, a precious soul who learns Torah, which is what a reference to the Torah is, is more valuable than jewels, than, than pearls. Even greater than the Kohen Gadol who goes inside, right, and gets to go to the Kodesh Kodeshim. What he did, his actions, will entrap him and he'll make it into hell. So it won't help you all the Torah you learned. And we're going to get to some statements about this later in today's talk as well. Okay, even though we're near the end, we'll be there soon. Amar Rabbi Yochanan Mishum Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai. Kol Adam Sheyesh Bo Since we mentioned this arrogance, and arrogance leads to impropriety with women. Well, anyone who has gasut ha-ruach, ki'ilu oved avodah kochavim. It's like you're worshiping idols. Because basically, again, you worship yourself, right? You worship, you don't, you worship nothing, okay? You're basically as opposed to worshiping God. K'tiv hacha, because if you're, you knew God was upon you, you wouldn't do such a thing. K'tiv hacha, to'avat Hashem kol gvalev. Where do we learn this from? Well, it says, anyone who's gvalev, who is arrogant, is, it, is despicable. K'tiv hatam, and it also says, Lo betecha, which is don't bring idols into your home. And it calls it toeva, and it calls that toeva. So from there we learn it's the same. Okay, someone who's arrogant is like toeva. By the way, this concept of arrogance is going to be the subject of much of tomorrow's stuff about all these things about arrogance. And again, we're in the middle of sota, and it's talking about, right, this is what leads to sota. As opposed to just talking about how do we deal with the process of sota, this Masechet is also trying to teach you how to avoid these kind of situations from happening and, and kind of understanding what's the root of the problem. Rabbi Yochanan Dideyamal, ki'ilu kafar bi'ikal. He says it's like rejecting God. Shene'amal, v'ram levavcha v'shachachta shashem alokecha. Right? This is in Sefer Dvarim, right? In Kochi v'otzim yadi, when you, know, you think you're so great. It says you're going to, your heart is going to be, ro- was going to rise, which basically means you think the world of yourself and you're going to forget God. That's what happens. When you're arrogant, you forget about God. It's the exact antithesis. Rabbi Chama Barchanina Amar, Ki'ilu Baal Kol They're basically saying, 
anyone who's arrogant, again, they're trying to deter arrogance, which we know exists all over the world, and therefore it was a very important thing for them to do. So they basically say, this is right, it's like worshiping idols, it's like saying there's no God, which is kind of similar to a certain extent, and it's as if you slept with every single woman who's forbidden to you. How do we know this? Again, they're going to compare that pasuk about anyone who's arrogant is toavaz, despicable. By the arayot, there's a summary verse which says, All these toavot, all these despicable things, the same word is used by the arayot. Ula'ama, last statement about this, it's as if you built a bama, bama is a, a, an altar outside the temple, but what it, most people think it means here is a bama to idols. It's a, an altar you build to worship idols. How do we know this? Okay, you should stay away from this man who's nishama ba'apo. Basically, that means he is arrogant. That's the way they understand it. Ki because Really, he's nobody, right? What's he, what's he considered? But al tikri bame el abama. Okay, because bama nechshavu. And yes, Miriam, thanks for pointing out. A bama is a high place. It's the same idea, right? It's a high place where you offer things on your own, basically. It's like you're making, either it's bamot of Jewish, where, you know, there's a temple and you decide, I'm offering it wherever I want, which is arrogance also. Or it's a bama for idols, which again, you're just saying, I'll just worship whatever I want. Okay, now we go back to this other verse that we saw before which was Tovat Hashem Kol Gvalev, the end of that pasuk is Yad Liyad Lo Yinake. It's also a pasuk from Mishle, by the way, from Proverbs. So now we're going to have a few different interpretations of Yad Liyad Lo Yinake. Okay? Something is Lo Yinake, will not be cleaned. Meaning, this is like we saw before, and we're going to see this statement in a number of different ways. We saw it before about one who learns Torah, if he engages in illicit behavior, he will not be forgiven. Right? So here also we're going to say, Yad li yad lo yinake, you will not be forgiven. So what is this talking about? Amarav. Kol habal eshetish, if you have relations with a married woman. Afilu hikneu la kadosh brachu, they're trying to figure out what's this yad. We're going to have three different interpretations. Even if God gave you shamayim va'aretz, like he gave to Abraham Avinu, you could be the biggest tzaddik in the world. Okay? Where God promised you the heavens and the earth. Where, where do we see this Yad connected with that? Dichtiv Bey, it says by Avraham, Harimoti Yadi El Hashem, I lifted my hand to God, El Elyon, Konesh Amayim Ba'aretz, right? The one who acquired heaven and earth. So basically, they say, even if you're as great as Avraham, who used this word Yadi, okay? So, Lo Yina Kemidi Nashal Genom. If you engage in, in sexual relations with some woman that's forbidden to you, you will not be you will not survive, you know, you, the, the judgment of Gehenno. So you could do, right, then this is going to be a statement where we're basically going to say either, you know, you're as an amazing person as Avraham Avinu. It doesn't make a difference. Okay, now we're going to have a different interpretation. Rabbi Shila. Rabbi Shila says that doesn't make sense to darshan it this way. Hayad liyad lo yinake. It shouldn't say yad liyad in the pasuk. If it wants to reference that pasuk with Avram of yadi, it should have said yadi me ba'ele. It should have said yadi and not, it should have used the exact formulation of the word. So Ella, Amri Debe Rabbi Shila, he said, Afilu kibel Torah ke Moshe Rabbeinu. What was the Torah was given to the Yad, right, from the Yad of God to Moshe. So Yad li Yad would be a perfect match of Torah. So now it's not saying you're as great as Abraham Avinu and you got all the rewards of Abraham, still you won't be saved. But it's saying, Afilu kibel Torah ke Moshe Rabbeinu, even if you got Torah like Moshe, meaning you were a great, great Torah scholar. And here we say, from the right hand of God it came. That's where we get the yad, from the right. It doesn't say hand in there, but we mean from the right hand of God. So from there you see, ah, yad the yad must be a reference to the Torah. And again, you could be a great Torah scholar, it doesn't make a difference. You will be punished. Meaning all your rewards that you have won't help you at all. Kashele the Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan says, that doesn't fit. Ha yad the yad. Yad mi yad me baile. If it's mi mi no from the hand of God, it should have said mi yad le yad. It shouldn't say right, or yad mi yad. Hand from hand. That's how we got the Torah. This doesn't mean Torah. El am Rabbi Yochanan. Afilu oset staka beseter. We'll finish at the top of the next daf here. Even if you do staka in secret, that's the highest level of charity. You give charity yad le yad. That's hand to hand. Okay. So, dichtiv, matam beseter yichpe'af. It says about, if you give money in beseter, 
Okay, there's also a Pasuk Mishle in Proverbs. If you give Tzedakah in secret, that will resolve the wrath of God. He will not, his wrath, of, the wrath of God will not be upon you. However, lo yina kemidi nashalgenom. Not if you engage in illicit behavior. So basically what this is saying, whichever interpretation you pick, right, all the rewards in the world will not protect you in the end if you engage in sexual relations that are inappropriate, that are wrong, right? This will, in the end, you will have to deal with uh, what you did and nothing you did in your life will be able to protect you from this. Okay, so if it's not obvious, they're trying to, you know, in Masechet Sota, talk about how important it is to keep away from this terrible sin. So we started with a whole Amud on how long is this Kedai Tumah that we can basically convict this woman, right, and make her go drink the Sota waters. What is the measurement of Kedai Tumah? And everybody in the end, based on Rabbi Yochanan anyway, everybody, whether we accept him or not, but Rabbi Yochanan's approach is we had so many different opinions, nine different ones, because everybody used their own personal experience and it's something that's very individualized, I guess. And that's the, again, what's the idea from it? I don't know where the takeaway from that is. But um, then we had to figure out Ben Azai. Okay, we had three answers for him. Then we got to this idea of this pasuk about the zona and the lechem, and we had a whole bunch of different interpretations. One of them had to do with not wa- you know, washing without a bracha, and from there, or not washing before you eat bread, from there we got off on a whole bunch of different halachot about washing hands, which seemed totally somewhat disconnected. From there we got to arrogance also, and, and um, then we really kind of talked about this topic of arrogance. Now, arrogance causes this kind of behavior to happen with illicit sexual behavior with sleeping with a married woman. And then we talked about, you know, these comparisons of, oh, pa- person who's arrogant is like X. And we had a few different options based on this Torah of pasuk. And then we tried to explain the end of that pasuk, what Yad Liyad is, which Chuyot won't help you in the end, you know, and whether one thinks the other one would or not, I don't really believe so. I think they all believe that nothing's going to help you. But it was more a matter of what was the reference in the pasuk? Was it to, which is just interesting, was it to someone you know, and this is, I think, the one that was hard to understand, but that God promised you Shemayin Ar, it's like Avraham, or someone who learned Torah, or someone who gave Tzedakah, right? Learning Torah and Tzedakah are two very different uh, mitzvot. Anyway, you have a lot of food for thought. And with that, I will, since I won't be seeing anyone personally until Pesach, I'll wish everyone a Chag Kasher B'Samach. And as I said before, the Zoom is going, coming back only on Friday after Pesach, but all the Shirim will be up starting today. They'll be up through the end of this week, and next Sunday morning they'll be up through the end till Thursday, through Thursday, after Pesach. Wishing everybody a Chag Kasher B'Samach.